Our next speaker is Dr. Blaise Aguirre, who is the Michael Hallander PhD Endowed Director of McLean Hospital's Three East Continuum, an array of programs for teens that use dialectical behavioral therapy to target self-endangering behaviors, as well as the symptoms of, of borderline personality disorder traits. An assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard, Dr. Aguirre is nationally and internationally recognized for his extensive work in the treatment of mood and personality disorders in adolescence. Dr. Aguirre will talk to us today about application of DBT to suicidality. Blaise. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, buenos dias a todo el mundo. Uh, me encanta estar con vosotros. I'm so glad that you're here uh, joining us uh, on this very, very important topic. Um, just to say a little bit about what we do is uh, uh, we started a, a dialectical behavior therapy uh, program uh, in 2007. We've treated about 5,000 uh, suicidal kids uh, in our program over the years from all over the world. Um, been very interested in the topic of suicide and um, from my perspective, I mean, I'm mostly a clinician and it's just an honor to follow uh, Dr. Brent um, uh, in, in this topic, but uh, I'm mostly a clinician. So these are more more like clinical ideas um, uh, that, that I have with, with a little bit of uh, research, but I've certainly found that uh, from my perspective, DBT has been the most powerful tool uh, in, in, in reducing suicidality and self-injury. Um, uh, it just contextually, um, you know, and I just think it was uh, just a timely uh, test text from my uh, from my son uh, sent me the screenshot of this text. Uh, he said, Dad, I just got a text from a girl in my school. She's been cutting herself because she, and tells me not to tell you because she knows you're a psychiatrist, but I feel like you might be able to help her out. She doesn't have to like be an official patient or whatever, but I'm pretty sure she's pretty close to making things a lot uh, more serious because she's been cutting. And, you know, um, my kids are aware of the work that I do. Uh, you can tell that this is a kid because they don't use punctuation. I, I, I've understood that uh, this is the way that adolescents communicate. They don't use punctuation. If you use punctuation, they think you're him. Um, but, but, you know, uh, in the absence of uh, care out there, um, you know, kids are desperate and, 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 and they're reaching out. Um, uh, Okay, so I just I want to talk a little bit about uh, a suicide and non-suicidal self-injury, um, and and you know this it's it's really highly prevalent. I mean uh, we're seeing it uh, uh, everywhere, um, uh, uh, you know whether in clinical populations or not clinical populations, um, uh, and um, even things are not the same thing at all. Um, that the the risk of suicide um, attempts and, and, and suicide itself is much, certainly much higher in those who've engaged in non-suicidal self-injury. 70% um, 70, 70 have attempted suicide um, at least once and 55% several times if they've uh, had uh, non-suicidal self-injury or cutting as some people might, might term it. Um, uh, people who harm are 30 to 50 times more likely to die by suicide depending on the level of non-suicidal Self-injury. So, uh, you know, Dr. Brent was talking about uh, assessing. Uh, for me, you know, this is mostly going to be a talk about the utility of dialectical uh, behavior therapy. I also want to talk a little bit about the myths uh, surrounding suicide, uh, because these are myths that, um, you know, I thought that I'd hear from uh, parents and uh, 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 schools. And, and uh, but I've, I've certainly heard some of these in uh, the lectures that I've given, you know, people asking me about uh, certain certain uh, things about suicide, they're just not true. All right, um, I'm not gonna cover many of the statistics. I, I do wanna highlight um, uh, uh, that uh, one of the trends that I've seen in the sexual minority uh, um, youth that are presenting to uh, for treatment, uh, they're about three times more likely uh, to present with suicidality than their heterosexual peers. Uh, we're seeing many, many transgender uh, youth um, uh, and um, uh, kids with gender dysphoria who are presenting, uh, uh, and 65% uh, of youth seriously considered suicide in the past year. Um, uh, I think that Dr. Uh, Ramshant is going to cover this material in greater depth uh, following my talk, but, but just just want to say that uh, this has been a really remarkable uh, 
experience and just the reduction of uh, uh, just suicidal thinking and, and attempts that family rejection of child or non-binary status increases a child's suicide risk. Uh, more than 40% of kids uh, reports uh, um, who live in a non-affirming family report a suicide uh, attempt. And that's simply affirming a kid's struggle with gender. Uh, leads to an immediate 50% reduction in suicide attempts. So just like recognizing, hey, look, this kid is struggling. Uh, they're, they're not identifying in a binary way, uh, you know, helps. Um, uh, belongingness, as Dr. Brent was talking about earlier, um, is, is really important. Uh, and, and that or the lack of it uh, can similarly impact gender minority status. So, so, you know, many schools have initiatives to just be as inclusive as they as they can be. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, um, you know, we, we've seen this maybe this slight drop off in uh, in overall suicide. Um, but but I, 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 you know, there are these deaths of what I call deaths of despair. Um, and so, uh, you know, so that when we add the rates of overdose deaths uh, among U.S. teenagers, which nearly doubled in 2020, the first year of COVID now, you know, deaths by overdose uh, are not uh, suicides at the same time. You know, I've had many parents who reached out to me who said that their kids were suicidal for a very long period of time and that they died by overdose. Um, and, you know, uh, either way, the, the, these parents had a child that was suffering uh, who died. Um, and uh, so uh, it's a tragic loss, uh, nevertheless, any, any child loss, of course, is, is, is tragic. Um, and certainly during the first year of the pandemic, um, these deaths of despair is another 20%. So, so whether by suicide or overdose, these are all deaths that uh, represent a degree of, uh, of um, suffering that the child is, is, is going through. Um, all right, so, so you know, my, the, the purpose of this talk is to talk about dialectical behavior therapy. And um, uh, it was developed by Dr. Marsha Linhan at the University of Washington, uh, who had uh, a great intriguing uh, suicidal people uh, and had used the treatment at the time, uh, which was a CBT for depression um, uh, and tried to help people who were uh, suicidal with CBT. And because it had proven efficacious in the treatment of depression, it led to more uh, suicidal behavior in people with conditions like borderline personality disorder, which is uh, you know, highly uh, correlated with uh, with suicide, and the reason was that um, um, that people who had severe emotional dysregulation, when they were told, uh, you know, like these are some skills that that might be able to help you. For instance, you know, if you get up out of bed, if you uh, you know spend some time in the sun, if you exercise. Um, uh, that might work for depression, but people with a severe emotional dysregulation felt that even those uh, those cognitive behavioral skills were very uh, difficult to implement. And uh, so they felt invalidated and think like, you, you don't understand how difficult this is. Um, she then attempted to uh, a more insight oriented psychodynamic uh, therapy. Um, and many people experience that kind of therapy felt very validated, felt very heard, um, very supported, but then they'd leave the therapy session and say, wait a second, I'm still suicidal. What do I do? So the idea was that uh, she integrated these two approaches uh, using um, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, plus uh, um, uh, acceptance strategies uh, based on uh, Zen and other uh, monastic um, types of meditative practices, uh, and then distilled what um, a lot of uh, religious traditions were doing in terms of mindfulness and non-religious uh, type of approach. So it was cognitive behavioral therapy plus uh, acceptance strategies uh, and, and mindfulness. And uh, that together with the psychopharmacology that we used, uh, uh, which is not part of DBT, but um, as an adjunct, uh, you know, we found tremendous, tremendous effectiveness. Um, and I just want to, you know, note that uh, Dr. Brett was saying, you know, that finding qualified therapists uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is very hard to do, although more and more people are getting trained in it. Now, the idea was this, that people who are suffering no one chooses to suffer. No one wakes up in the morning saying, today I'm gonna to suffer. But that what they did not have is they did not have abilities 
in regulating their emotions, didn't have an ability in regulating their relationships, tolerating um, stressful situations, and um, uh, uh, either and mentalizing or, uh, or awareness of, of their uh, sort of sense of uh, self. And uh, many of the kids who, certainly I used to see in the days before DBT, you know, people say, okay, well, can you treat this person with depression? But I didn't just have depression. I mean, they had depression and ADHD and substance use problems and problems at home and problems at school and problems in their relationships. And so like, oh my goodness, where do you start? Um, so, so, but, but if you keep chasing symptoms, it's going to be a, a, a very, very, very long therapy. So the idea in dialectical behavior therapy was, look, if you're dead, you, you're not going to be able to work on all of these things. So what we're going to target is we're going to target the suicidality first and foremost. Yes, you might want to talk about rejection. Yes, you might want to talk about uh, uh, and other worries. But, but we have to reduce your suicidality and self-injury because often, as Dr. Brent previously noted, was that uh, you know suicidality and self-injury, the purpose of it is sometimes to escape from a, from a painful emotional state. And, you know, these things work very, very quickly, much quicker than therapy. Uh, the second thing was uh, treatment interfering behavior. Someone doesn't show up to therapy, they're not gonna be able to uh, benefit from therapy. Uh, and then quality of life interfering behavior, substance abuse, uh, dangerous encounters. Then once a person was more regulated and more stable and had the skills to be able to manage these things, uh, working on exposure therapy and emotional processing of the past. But um, often therapists jump into exposure therapy and emotional processing of the past before they've done stage one. And then what happens is that people uh, get so uh, uh, overwhelmed and triggered by uh, um, these exposures that they then head into self uh, suicidality and self-injury. And then after that is building the life, uh, a life worth living as, as Lynn Han liked it through, you know, self-respect and, and individual goals. Um, okay, now I was trained as an analyst and a psychopharmacologist, but, but I switched to DBT when I heard these assumptions that at any given point in time, Every single one of us is doing the best that we can. To me, that was a mind blowing revelation because I certainly think that I am doing the best that I can at any given time. Um, uh, a couple of nights ago, a couple of days ago, I wasn't, you know, I was exhausted, but that was the best that I could do under that exhausted state. Um, you know, uh, we want perfect uh, patients. We want patients who, who will follow our directions, but something's getting in the way of them doing so that they want to improve, that they have to learn new behaviors in relevant contexts. I used to work on an inpatient unit and you know, people would uh, get better, but then they'd go home and deteriorate because what they were learning on the inpatient unit wasn't translatable. Um, that they may not have caused all their problems, but they have to solve them anyway. And uh, that's agency, that's autonomy. That's not me taking over your life. It's you learning how to you know, give a person a, a fish and they eat for a day, give a... a they eat for a lifetime so it, it's uh although with global warming you know i mean i'm hoping that uh that we have lakes and ponds so that people can fish um that the lives of suicidal people are really unbearable and you know in a certain sense suicide makes sense i mean if you were to think about the very very worst day of your life and just say you are going to repeat that day over and over and over again that it's possible that this thought would come into your head. And if you can just say like, you're suffering and it's unbearable and we're gonna try and see if we can help you. So, so what are the elements of the treatment? And this, doc, again, Dr. Brent was talking about, like it's, it's a bit complex, not everybody's trained in it. Uh, there's individual therapy, there's skills group where we teach this, uh, the, the, you know, we, I talked earlier on, it was a skills deficit problem that we see in many of the kids who come to our program. We want to generalize these skills. So we, um, I mean, uh, every one of my patients has my uh, uh, telephone number. Now, now this terrifies a lot of colleagues, the idea that pa my patients have my telephone number. I want them to call me when they're struggling. Now people say, okay, aren't they going to misuse that? In DBT, I don't, I mean, I have very, very rare times other than when they've needed it. Uh, that, that they actually use it for skills coaching. Of course, you can't just uh, do it outside of the context of DBT. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, that because 
uh, working with suicidal people is uh, can be be burnout inducing and it can be emotionally draining. We have a team of other DBT therapists that support uh, each other. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the great Adolis Winnicott said there's no such thing as an infant, but I think that there's no such thing as a, a child or an adolescent. A child and adolescent is, uh, lives in the context of uh, adults and whether it's a family and by family, I'm speaking about family broadly. So, um, si yo hablo en español, solo me entienden los españoles. So if I speak Spanish, only people who speak Spanish are going to be able to understand me. So if the kids learn this treatment, I want the parents to learn this treatment um, uh, as, as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, other uh, there's so much comorbidity in the kids that we see that um, uh, um, uh, that we need, obviously, things like psychopharmacology. If a person has uh, difficulty in regulating their emotions and emotions lead to suicidal behavior, then we teach them the skills to manage their emotions. If they have a difficult, a difficult time tolerating stressful situations, we teach them distress tolerance skills. If they have difficulty in relationships, we teach them interpersonal effectiveness. If they have difficulty with awareness and paying attention and thinking about others' minds and their own minds, we teach them mindfulness. This is part of the whole package. In adolescence, we also teach uh, what we call the middle path the skills that are necessary um, in terms of behaviorism and validation between uh, parents and uh, and children. Um, okay, I just want to then give a plug for, um, so these, these slides, by the way, people are often asking, like, are these slides going to be available? Yes. Uh, so these are just the slides. Um, and I wanted to say the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so uh, there's a, been a very long-term study. Now I think it's a three-year study. Um, uh, uh, they had, uh, you know, 77 kids in it, um, and then at the uh, dialectical behavioral therapy for adolescents remained superior for um, uh, enhanced uh, usual care in terms of the frequency of self-harm. Uh, but it turned out that for suicidal ideation, depressive symptoms, and borderline sy symptoms, it didn't really have that much of an impact. Originally, it did at one year and at two years, but these things seem to have sort of plateaued. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a reduction in self-harm. And earlier on, I'd say that self-harm, um, you know, people who self-harm have, you know, are, are at greater risk for uh, completed suicide. Um, another study, the adolescents, and again, you can look at the studies that, that and they'll be posted on the slides, um, uh, that uh, even though, uh, you know, people who get um, a DBT, um, uh, you know, got a, a marked reduction, repeat suicide attempts, no suicidal self-injury and total self-harm. And, but this, this waned over time. Um, it weakened over the time, but it did, it did persist. And, and, you know, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if, if you train for a, a marathon and then, uh, you know, um, after a few, after running the marathon, you only train for one or two kilometer races, see that, um, uh, let me just see here. All right, sounds like you're wrapping up. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh my goodness, this normally takes me two weeks to teach. So uh, I'm trying to like get through all of these things. So so look, this the bottom line is that most of these studies show reductions in suicidality and self-injury, which is really important. Um, but for, you know, but that these uh, um, benefits seem to wane, uh, you know, after a period of time, the way that uh, not using any skill that you've learned train over time. So I just I do want to say something about um, these myths about suicide. And again, as Dr. Brent said, you know, I've often given talks at schools and people say, well, don't talk about it uh, because people are going to increase their suicidality. I've had colleagues who've said, I don't ask my patients about suicide because I don't want to plant the seed uh, in their minds. Just not true. There's no evidence that this is true. And in fact, the opposite is true, that talking about it uh, brings it into the open and um, uh, uh, allows you to target it. Uh, that you can't talk about it. It's 100% an opportunity for communication. Imagine it's medic, and you said, okay, we can't talk about wheezing. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, okay, that if they talk about it, they won't do it. Um, I take suicide extremely seriously, and um, I never think of it as attention seeking. As, as uh, Dr. Brent pointed out, it's really 
you know, attention seeking uh, in terms of suicidal ideation, very low percentage, about 7%. Uh, it happens without warning. The vast majority of uh, young people uh, do have uh, a warning, and it's very important uh, to know the warnings. Um, again, uh, you know, this, the, the younger the age, for me, the more concerning it is, the more the frequency of, uh, and, and uh, uh, extremity of uh, non-suicidal self-injury, the worse. Uh, again, it's attention-seeking. Um, you know, the other thing is, um, it's so hard, as Dr. Ren pointed out, to find like a good DBT therapy. But here's the thing, here's what's really awesome, is it turns out that the mediating uh, component of dialectical behavior therapy, in, for most cases, appears to be uh, the acquisition of skills. So if you have resources to do one thing, and run groups uh, in DBT and teach the skills of DBT, because um, then you can have you know eight to ten kids in a group rather than having to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, therapy. Um, the other thing is this, uh, and this is like uh, you know whatever therapy you do, connection is the most powerful and healing force in the universe. And you know I love the the, the letter writing campaign. You know for uh, for you young people, uh, letters are things with that you wrote on paper with pens. But you know, it's not text. But I, you know, we like to send out letters and just say, "Hey, just thinking about you." Letting people know that you're thinking about it uh, then reduces uh, uh, the risk of suicide. So, um, so we're seeing a lot of struggles, and I'm sure all over the world, uh, many mental health systems uh, are, are really swamped. Uh, DBT has a significant evidence base. It's, you know, if tomorrow I find a better solution, I'm going to do that one. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, two just very quick things would be to consider running uh, DBT skills groups and uh, just send a letter to people who've struggled and just say, you know, thinking about you. And that is about that. So right. please, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of great questions coming in. So I want to get to them right away. Sure. Typically, when people are, are thinking about young people and suicide, they're thinking about depression. However, we're seeing, I mean, significant um rates of severe anxiety in young people, especially over the last two and three years. Would you speak to the connection between suicidality and severe anxiety in adolescents? Yeah, I mean, but, 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 look, he, uh, you know, um, many of the kids who come to us, about 80% would meet criteria for, uh, um, for uh, like a, an anxiety disorder. Uh, so it's highly, highly comorbid. But but I think um, it's, you know, one thing, I mean, I used to see lots of anxious people who were not uh, suicidal. I think it has to also do with, uh, it's, it's bigger than just this term anxiety. In the same way that, uh, you know, when people talk about depression, it's bigger than this term depression. One of the other things that's, that, that we're seeing a lot is this sort of sense of self, current political climate, uh, worried about the future, uh, and things like that. And I think that we have to take all of these things into account. Wise. You know, what, what I see sometimes happen is that people get prescribed anti-anxiety agents uh, uh, and, and kids still remain uh, anxious. So I think that um, uh, in terms of anxiety, you know, you might have a generalized anxiety disorder, but I would really uh, explore that a little bit further. And, uh, you know, this is where the role of CBT would actually uh, be pretty useful in, in some of these kids. To jump on to, to future, you mentioned future planning very briefly there. Would you talk about how that's either a prevention factor or a risk factor in young people? You know, I, I, look, um, I, the, 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 uh, um, the best uh, way for me to learn a language is to start young or to learn an instrument is to start young. And I think, you know, we insist on physical wellness, but we don't in schools, but we don't insist on mental wellness. And I just think, you know, that there's actually some evidence and certainly in terms of borderline personality disorder that that uh, early intervention is is key. And, 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 you know, I wish that schools would have as part of their overall curriculum, a mental wellness curriculum that teaches emotion regulation skills to stress and um, you know, I, a, a lot of schools are moving towards social emotional learning curricula, and uh, I, I think that that's uh, it's key. You know, we all we have a tendency to intervene, you know, in the middle of a crisis, but it's too late. Then you know, the time to intervene is ten years ago by starting in schools, uh, and so that's you know that, that that's where I would go. That's where you're going to get the biggest uh, bang for the buck or for the bitcoin. 
multiple people reached out after uh, seeing your text with your son and were asking as a provider or as a parent, what do you do when a young person is talking about someone that they care about, someone in their friend group is engaging in self-harm? Yeah. So this is one of those things that I've told my own kids uh, and anybody else that, you know, whereas um, it's, you know, if people say, hey, you know, I, I kissed somebody or I got a tattoo or something like that, I'm not going to necessarily disclose that. With suicide and self-injury, I have not only a, a legal obligation, but I think an, an ethical and moral obligation to reach out uh, to the parents, to school counselors, to whoever it is. So if I know about it, I'm going to reach out, even if I'm asked to. That is one of those places where I'm not going to uh, uh, keep uh, private. Um, yeah. I can't think of someone who's better to, um, to answer this question. We've had a bunch of these come up. What do you, any suggestions for providers who are having difficulty with young people and their willingness to commit to getting better? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, he, here's the thing is, I, I used to get really scared of this idea of this commitment, but here's the thing is, this the re most remarkable thing is that I have not yet met an adolescent who isn't willing. But the problem is this, is that uh, when people come into therapy, uh, 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 you know, uh, we don't show them the path forward. And when we say, okay, this is how you're suffering. These are the steps that I'm going to take you through to get to the other side. Once they can see that path, I get a lot of kids jumping on board because when I say, okay, I'm going to put you on this you know, medication for six weeks or it may or may not work, or I'm gonna just talk to you about your problems and that may or may not work. But if I say, look, you're having a problem regulating your emotions. I'm gonna teach you how to regulate your emotions. You're having a problem with your romantic relationships, effective way, skillful way to deal with that. Then they say, okay, I see, I see a path forward. So we actually have a you know, tremendous amount of kids who seemingly were unmotivated, who actually commit to the therapy. You know, we can't keep, well, I'm sure none of us are, are, are staying away from Netflix these days, and we certainly can't keep young people away from the mm -hmm. streaming platforms. Um, some providers are saying that they've seen, you know, an uptick in suicidal yeah. or mm -hmm. non-suicidal uh, ideation and be, in suicidal behaviors based on programming that they are watching. Mm -hmm. Any suggestion around yeah. helping mm -hmm. young people kind of navigate that? Helping yeah, them, uh, helping I, them to, is, yeah. I actually gave a, I gave a talk earlier this week at, uh, at New York University. So here's the thing is, you know, you're not going to kid kids off social media. But what I do is this, you know, if somebody eats gluten and they have a bad reaction to it, I say, okay, do you want to keep eating gluten? I actually have the kids open their social media in my office and get them to, to be aware of their experience. If it's helpful, carry on. If it's not helpful, pay attention to what that's telling you. So I actually say, look, I mean, I want you to have social media bad or, uh, or you have to get off it. I think we're at time. We are. I've got, I've got one more question that I really wanted to um, yeah. ask for someone. One of the things that um, a bunch of people have reached out about is, is schools and any roles that educators can play in helping to um, yeah. play, play a positive Brilliant. role in suicide prevention in the classroom. Okay, so here's the thing is, no school teacher, no school decided to become a, a mental health clinic or a mental health service. But the truth of the matter is that many kids have psychiatric diagnosis, kids are on medications. Whether you like it or not, schools are uh, a part of the, the solution. And I just think that uh, uh, increasing awareness, uh, bringing in psychoeducation uh, to schools, uh, bringing in mental health resources, starting early uh, is absolutely key because whether we like it or not, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot there. Blaze, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you being with us.